Hello and welcome everyone to the Beta Shares Franklin Templeton EINC, the Active Opportunity in High Yielding Aussie Shares. Thank you all so much for jumping on on a Thursday morning. Hope everyone's uh, safe for any of those states that are still in lockdown. Um, we are very, uh, very glad to have you here today. But we'll get on with the webinar, conscious of everyone's time. Before we start, just a little bit of admin to get out the way. Uh, you will be receiving a recording of this webinar. So if you do miss anything, if you need to pop away and make yourself a cup of tea or whatever it may be, don't worry, you can come back and we'll be sending this out shortly after the webinar so you can catch up on any of those points covered today. And as we do go through the webinar, please do ask some questions, uh, make some nice, interesting, curly ones for myself or Reese to cover at the end, as there will be dedicated time there for a Q&A. The important disclaimer side, as always, I'm uh, just going to note that this is an advisor only presentation and distribution. So it's not meant for any of your retail clients, unfortunately. And also, past performance is not indicative of future performance as well. So I'll just give you another moment to take a quick read over those other points. Excellent. Then, in terms of the speakers today, uh, myself, Chris Yates, I'm a director here at Beta Shares in charge of the advisor service business for New South Wales and ACT. So, hopefully, some of my advisor clients has joined us today. And a very warm welcome to all those other advisors from those other states. We are very fortunate to have Reese Bertels with us today. Um, he is the chief investment officer at Martin Curry, and he'll be covering off that investment strategy in terms of the equity income ETF. Thank you so much, Reese, for taking the time with us. Now, just before we start, we'll get a poll question up just to have a look at that. Just waiting for that poll question to come. There it is there, lovely stuff. In the current low interest rate environment, how are your clients satisfying their income requirements? So are they eating into their capital, currently not being met, or moving up the risk spectrum? I'll give everyone a moment to click through on their answer there. Sorry, I think that just closed very quickly. Look, we've got moving up the risk spectrum. I think the poll just closed before we got a chance to get some of those answers in there, but we'll move on anyway. And in terms of the agenda, um, we've got the welcome out of the way, so that's a good start. Um, I'll be giving an update about beta shares and our partnership with Franklin Templeton. Uh, Reese will then be covering an update from Martin Curry. Of course, we will look, be looking in more detail around EINC, which is our equity income strategy, which Reese will be covering that in terms of the active opportunities in high yielding Aussie shares. Um, looking at, I guess, broadly the Australian economy, looking at those companies' earnings and dividends, how capital management activities are contributing to income growth. And I guess one of the important things is why why now it is a good time to capitalise from undervaluing of stable yields and income growth. And that all important, I guess, point there around how high quality Australian shares can help support the annual expense for retirees and provide some inflation protection to help deliver sufficient income growth, which, you know, speaking with advisors is one of the real pain points in terms of their asset allocation and meeting those objectives for their clients currently. I'll be giving an overview of the equity income strategy. It's a broad objective portfolio performance and also positioning and how it's been used within context of those portfolio and income growth goals. And as mentioned before, there's going to be plenty of time for some questions as we go through. An update from Beta Shares. Uh, Beta Shares, and hopefully all the advisors that are on here today uh, have used Beta Shares uh, funds in the past. And if you have, thank you so much for taking the time to review and select any of our ETF strategies. And again, a warm welcome to any new. 
beta shares advisors um, that haven't selected a fund yet. But beta shares, we are a leading ETF provider here in Australia. We and another ETF fund manager take well over 50, 60% of total market inflow net. Um, so really getting strong support from our Australian investors. And we do that from having that Australian centric lens and looking at all asset classes in terms of what's going to deliver the maximum value to an Australian investor, be it a low cost Australian equity exposure at seven basis points through to global markets, sector, strategy based ETF, smart beta, all the way through to active management. And by taking that agnostic view in terms of portfolio construction and ETF construction, we are now over $19 billion in terms of assets under management. So thank you again for any investor advisors today that are help support us to get to that amazing goal of over 19 billion. In terms of the active strategies, uh, we partnered with uh, Franklin Templeton on in terms of their equity income strategy, which will be coming today with Reese, which is under that ASX ticker code of EINC. Another income focused strategy we often see advisors use in terms of their asset allocation is in their property plus allocation, which is the real income fund under RINC, which also is managed by the Martin Curry team. And another one where we often find very hard for investors to access and understand is that emerging market allocation and portfolios. And you, now you can do that through that high conviction strategy, which is the beta shares legomation emerging markets fund under EMMG. And of course that final one there, which is the fixed income allocation, which is another pretty tough allocation to, to be uh, investing in that space at the moment, but you can outsource that to again, one of the top quartile active managers in the fixed income markets, which is, a, is the Western asset team. And that's under that ticker code of BNDS. And just to make it nice and clear, Leg Mason was acquired by Franklin Templeton last year in July. Um, so made that acquisition, which at that point, um, has made Franklin Templeton one of the largest independent active managers in the world. Um, and this is really providing the IP that's packaged up in this global reach of Franklin Templeton to our ASX investors. So Franklin Templeton now is in over 34 different countries with offices. They've got 70 plus years in terms of asset management experience, manage a whopping $2 trillion in US dollars globally and giving again access to those strategies with over 1,250 investment specialists and almost 11,000 employees globally. So again, uh, this is a great partnership that we have with Franklin Templeton and being able to provide their high conviction strategies to our ASX investors. So that's the update from me. I'll pass it over now to Reese to cover off the Martin Curry update and also that equity income strategy. Over to you, Reese. Morning, Chris. Uh, thank you. And morning, everyone. So Martin Curry is a, a specialist active equity manager. Uh, we're based in Melbourne and in Edinburgh in Scotland. And we have uh, a number of strategies across global equities, emerging markets and Australian equities and real assets. Uh, we have a long-standing team in the Australian market with 18 investment professionals uh, based in Melbourne. And we've uh, got a very uh, active process whereby we look at the uh, each stock on a valuation, quality, sustainable dividend and earnings direction basis that we use across a range of products to meet client outcomes. The in For Martin Curry Australia, we, we focused on income strategies from 2010, launching the, the equity income strategy as well as the real income strategy at that time, really with a focus on delivering growing and sustainable income for retirees in a post GFC world where we expected uh, rates to remain low for a long period of time. Across the business, we manage uh, $30 billion uh, with about uh, $10 billion from, from the Australian business. Moving, uh, so today I'll, I'll look at the market outlook for, for Australian shares and especially in the context of going into uh, the, the reporting season in, in August uh, with a few pre-announcements already in, in July. And then I'll look at how we think ec the equity income strategy should be used uh, in client portfolios where they're looking for uh, retirement income. So starting on the, the, the economic backdrop uh, going into this reporting season, 
it's been extremely strong uh, since uh, November last year, really, um, with, with announcements on the vaccine. So the World uh, Purchasing Managers Index provides a good backdrop to understanding what conditions companies face on a global basis. Uh, and that was rising strongly through, through the first quarter of this year and, and probably reached a peak uh, in April or May this year at near uh, 64, which suggests very strong uh, GDP growth conditions across the world. Uh, but in, in recent months, you know, one of the things that's changed the market dynamic has been that the rate of improvement has slowed, uh, which has probably been associated with, with bond yields peaking in, in the recent environment. Um, and But we, we expect it to remain at quite high levels for a period of time. The reason this is important for, for company earnings is it means that in the last uh, six months uh, earnings period for, for results, uh, we think companies have had very strong conditions broadly for them. Obviously, you know, some have been impacted um, by lockdowns to a, to a greater and lesser degree if they're more domestically uh, focused and, and, and focused on physical stores, but broadly it's been good conditions for companies. Looking at uh, the Australian conditions, uh, consumer confidence and business conditions, which are the, the best indicators of, um, of the likely earnings environment for, for companies, has again been very strong um, through this six month period, uh, which, which would be supportive of earnings. Unfortunately, a, a lot of these conditions were um, prior to the recent Sydney and Melbourne lockdowns. And whilst we think that companies uh, can deliver uh, strong results for this last six month period, uh, we think there'll be a less confidence when management comes to providing guidance uh, going forward uh, with, with their results in August. So, you know, just even prior to those lockdowns, we would have expected strong results and then much more positive outlooks. Um, but they, I think everyone will be tempering that, talking about the uncertainty um, around lockdowns. Um, moving, sorry, moving forward to um, some of the more sub-components of, of the market, we think um, when you look at household income, uh, obviously, you know, things like JobKeeper have, have gone away, um, but the, the actual fundamental, the more fundamental uh, wage-driven drivers of compensation and earnings based on hours worked and employment um, have accelerated strongly. And, and we tend to find that, you know, as you saw in that consumer confidence uh, measures, that this is more important uh, to how consumers feel um, than, than things like subsidies and, 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 and JobKeeper. Um, so we think that provides uh, a good outlook for consumer companies. Uh, so we, you know, we're seeing very strong uh, like-for-like sales and profitability still for the retailers such as JB Hi-Fi, uh, Harvey Norman and Supercheap. Their earnings uh, today are, are well above pre-COVID levels and they've been maintaining the strength that they had through last year. So I think it, it highlights how um, lockdowns, you know, may impact things like uh, shopping centres, but for companies like uh, JB, Harvey Norman, Supercheap, Wes Farmers, they, they've really managed to adapt uh, to that environment and demand from consumers has been very strong uh, given they're not traveling overseas and spending that 50 or 60 billion dollars that normally gets uh, spent overseas. Then looking at um, more activity indicators, um, for example in, in housing uh, and, and construction, uh, we can see that obviously house prices have been very strong uh, since the stimulus uh, with, with rate cuts and uh, with since COVID, and that's very supportive of current uh, building activity. Uh, so we're seeing very high levels of new new building starts, and so again, this is quite supportive of those companies exposed to uh, domestic construction activity. Then turning to to resource stocks, uh, we've been in an environment, uh, especially for iron ore um, and for the miners exposed to copper and iron ore, the the main commodities. Uh, where commodity prices are extremely strong and this has been resulting in earnings upgrades uh, for the companies and their, their at or near peak cycle profitability uh, currently. 
And so that that's very supportive for for the the earnings and dividend payments of of the large miners. Obviously, we've had uh, Rio's uh, result even yesterday um, with a big increase in in the dividend uh, and the payout ratio, reflecting the very strong uh, cash flows, and and clearly earnings um, have kept up with with those commodity prices. More more interestingly, has been in the energy space where last year the the oil price was was obviously very low through COVID, um, but has recovered strongly since that time as world demand has been returning uh, with with activity uh, since uh, lockdowns have been reducing. But the the earnings picture for those companies has been more subdued. There's definitely a lot of pessimism in the in the energy stocks around energy transition and there's been a, a reluctance to spend uh, drilling new wells which is quite supportive for the oil price at this time. So heading in into reporting season uh, we, we look at the the trend in terms of how consensus uh, brokers have been uh, revising uh, their, their earnings revisions and we've clearly been in a six-month period where the earnings per share revisions across the market uh, have been very strong. It's really the the strongest six month period we've seen in the last ten years since the GFC uh, for earnings upgrades, and and given that this you know generally indicates that we'll we'll have a quite strong set of results um, going going into reporting season, and and even in July already there's been four percent upgrades to to future earnings forecasts. The, the other indicator that you can look at for, for how reporting season will go is the ABS profit data. Uh, we, we received the March quarter profits from the ABS and obviously um, companies have not necessarily reported their March quarter yet. And that was still at very strong levels, um, slightly down on, on the December quarter, but um, well up on year on year, which again uh, bodes well going into reporting season. So looking um, at the at forecasts uh, ex expected from brokers across the market, when you look at it from a margin point of view, uh, the, there's very strong expectations for a rebound in profit margins um, from what was you know, the subdued position that we're in in 2020. Um, and we, we'd actually suggest that there's some risk to that margin expansion at this point, um, especially given given lockdowns and uh, the high levels, the fact that uh, margins have gone above pre-COVID. I think in, in a lot of companies where we've seen an acceleration of digital transformation um, and cost out and, and, and move away from um, physical delivery, which is quite supportive of that margin expansion long-term, um, but it's moved quite quickly in the short term. And then from a revenue point of view, uh, the sales uh, forecasts have, have rebounded. Um, they're obviously far far more subdued in the in the cycle compared to earnings, and nominal GDP, um, which is which is a reasonable forecast of of where earnings are going, uh, are pretty much in line. So um, we've seen a, a nice rebound in earnings across the market. So looking to to what that means for uh, dividend payouts for for you know, income paying stocks uh, into this reporting season. We're very optimistic on, on dividends. Uh, we actually think we'll get better dividend upgrades um, across the market than we will on, on an earnings basis. And that's because uh, companies reduced their payout ratios during 2020 to conserve cash, uh, given the uncertainty around COVID. And so the payout ratio uh, delivered across the market has fallen from about 65% to 58%. Um, uh, over the last 12 months from pre-COVID uh, to now, but we're beginning to see uh, that companies are, are likely to raise that dividend payout ratio. And again, Rio was a good example of that uh, yesterday where they uh, took their payout ratio to the top of the range at 70% uh, from more conservative levels. We also expect uh, that you'll see uh, other forms of, 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 of buybacks. So for example, in the banks, uh, they their capital ratios are now extremely strong uh, given that their risk weighted assets have reduced with less economic uncertainty compared to what they had expected last year uh, and their loan loss charges have gone from being very large to provide for a recession to likely write backs 
And so already we've seen an on-market buyback from ANZ, uh, given that strong capital position. Uh, each of the major banks is probably running a, a, a T1 ratio of about 14%, and they should be more like 11 and a half, um, which requires capital returns. And we expect, uh, for example, Commonwealth Bank could do up to a $6 billion capital return, um, which is likely be an off-market buyback um, with, with a franked dividend component. And then the, the other form uh, we'll see is in, in terms of special dividends from companies uh, where they uh, probably don't have the size to do an off-market buyback. Uh, and, and you saw that with Rio yesterday, but we, we would also expect quite strong capital returns out of, for example, the, the consumer stocks like JB Hi-Fi, uh, Super Cheap and, and, and Harvey Norman, uh, given the, the super profitability they've had in recent time. Um, and that that they need to return some of that cash. You know, effectively they've gone to to no debt situation uh, through through the COVID period. So in terms of uh, our outlook going forward, um, we you know, obviously tempered by the, the the current lockdowns and and the uncertainty in regards to that. But we see that the monetary and fiscal uh, stimulus, both globally and in Australia. Uh, is the most coordinated uh, and strong it's been since the GFC, um, and and we're getting a rebound uh, in activity, which is um, you know very very supportive for for activities for for companies, and we also expect um, despite setbacks that the vaccine rollout uh, will allow uh, lockdowns to reduce over the next uh, 12 months. We, we do think that there is uh, significant transitory inflation pressures, um, given uh, shortages in, in supply chains. Um, but, and there's, there's a chance that that inflation will be more persistent than expected, which will be quite a different investment environment in terms of supporting um, equities compared to more um, defensive type, type assets going forward. And, and as I said, I think we, we think that companies are in a strong position to uh, return capital uh, through this uh, reporting season, and and when you look at the 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 outlook for for equities, the forward yield on on dividends for for strategies like equity income um, with Inc uh, is so strong at in excess of six percent franked compared to alternatives that we think uh, this would be very supportive for for prices going forward. So now if I turn to, uh, to, to how we think about using uh, e-ink in, in portfolios for retirees, uh, I'll talk about our philosophy in terms of designing this strategy for retirees, which is very much about providing a sufficient income for life. Uh, and so, you know, the, the key words in terms of that sufficient income is that it, it's a uh, high enough level of income to be able su to support a retiree's uh, living expenses. And we need that income to, to, gr to offset inflation over time um, and to be supportive over a, a 20 year odd ex uh, expected retirement period rather than just eating into capital over time. And we think most strategies uh, that you see in, uh, in the ASX 200 index type strategies as well as most active strategies have really been designed for the accumulation phase where they're thinking about total risk and return rather than that need for a sufficient income uh, during retirement. So looking at uh, almost a financial planning problem that, that you face every day with your clients is uh, we've, we've sort of modeled a, a, a typical scenario of, of a couple having $500,000 in assets, access to about $30,000 from the pension and requiring about $22,000 a year from their investment portfolio um, to be able to meet uh, the ASFA standard for a, a comfortable retirement income um, of, of $51,000. So, you know, basically we, we see the problem, uh, you know, this, that, that retirees have is that they need about $22,000 of income from that $500,000 portfolio which is about a 4% yield um, starting level. But what we think is critical is that it's not a 4% yield they need. They need $22,000 and they need that $22,000 to grow over time rather than a, a constant yield. Uh, 
Um, they're also obviously looking for you know reduced volatility in terms of that income uh, to cover their needs and and for it to grow to off, offset inflation and, and longevity issues so when so here we've um, looked at how different asset classes and strategies uh, deliver on an expected return and risk basis on the left hand side um, in a typical accumulation sense where you know, what, what is the expected return compared to the capital volatility risk uh, that, that each strategy has over time. And you see a typical upward sloping efficient frontier where the more risk you take, the more expected uh, income you get. And that's the, the typical accumulation strategy. But when you get to, to retirement and we're saying, you, ne you know, you need that level of income, which is around a 4% a level of income, and you don't want that income stream to be volatile so that you can rely on living on it for uh, for your retirement needs, we think you see a, an upside down efficient frontier where strategies that have high income actually have less volatility or variability in their income stream um, than the low yielding assets. And you know, whilst we clearly recognise there's a very different capital risk profile between um, term deposits and, and shares, it's, it's interesting to note that um, TDs, whilst they have no capital risk, they, they have very little income and they have the most variability in the income stream over time. And that's similar in, in other defensive asset classes uh, like fixed income. And what we've really tried to do with um, EINC, equity income and, and real income, RINC, is to deliver a level of income that is well above um, the typical drawdown rate, uh, which means that uh, the retiree can and rely on that income stream um, without having to focus on capital volatility over time. And so uh, here we've, we've looked at since inception on um, our strategies. If you'd invested uh, $500,000 into a number of different asset um, classes or, or products over um, that period, what level of income that would have been delivered to you uh, over time? So for equity income, um, about $40,000 a year uh, would have been delivered. Clearly we had a drawdown in income in 2020, but that's rebounding strongly now with the recovery in profits. And uh, real income has delivered a similar profile. So they provi have provided the highest level of income compared to uh, other asset classes, and that's purely from the dividend income. There's no capital return uh, in those numbers. And it's quite stark when you compare that to uh, what we've def called a typical high yield index approach, so a passive high yield product, which on uh, advertised forward yields today is quite similar to equity income, but you can see on the grey line that the income stream from that uh, typical rules-based index high yield approach uh, is significantly lower today at $25,000. And the reason is that those rules-based strategies really can suffer from uh, loss of capital uh, and, and drawdowns in income because they tend to be quite concentrated on the highest yielding part of the market at any point in time, uh, such as the miners in 2016. And then when uh, you know, uh, commodity prices fall, they tend to sell out afterwards and it tends to be at the low point in the cycle. So because they're rules-based, you know, they're not really passive strategies, they're much more active and they're much more likely to suffer from high concentrations of income um, in particular spaces that prove not to be sustainable and 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 therefore uh, have far more variability in the dollar income stream uh, compared to uh, our strategies that are really designed to have diversity and delivery of that dollar income. And just to to make the point in terms of um, of the capital, so even after paying out those that that sort of average of forty thousand dollars a year of income, the capital value of the initial five hundred thousand dollars has grown over time, and that's why it's important not to to have um, strategies in income that turn capital into income, because your capital base would erode over time. And clearly, uh, you know, in the more defensive asset classes, the capital base is continuously eroding, 
and and therefore uh, this creates the whole longevity risk for clients. If you look today uh, for a new investor uh, with five hundred thousand uh, dollars, equity income is providing uh, about a six point four percent forward yield or thirty two thousand dollars of income, uh, so well in excess. Uh, of alternative uh, strategies uh, going forward. And I think this is clearly one of the things that's quite supportive for, for yield-based strategies in the market today. If I turn to um, you know, what we do in equity income that is different to, for example, those high-yielding uh, passive strategies, there's a couple of aspects that we think are really critical um, to, to delivering that stability and growth in the income stream. Um, firstly, it's about concentration risk. So about seven stocks in the ASX 200 uh, represent uh, about 60% of the entire yield of the index, given their large index weights and current high dividends. And that, that creates obviously significant risk of circumstances change. For example, when the banks had to cut their dividends um, around you know, APRA restrictions or the miners uh, go through a, a, a down cycle, um, you know, due to iron ore price changes, there's, there's a chance that that yield on the index can fall significantly. And when you look at the high yield uh, uh, passive strategies, they're even more concentrated uh, in that source of income. Whereas our approach is to have no more than 5% uh, to any one stock, regardless of index weight. So we think about the absolute risk per each stock and we build a far more diversified portfolio uh, in delivering our yield. The other aspect and, and, and something that uh, rules-based strategies really suffer from is on the quality distribution of stocks. So typically, the highest yielding stocks in the market are what you might call value traps that are, that are likely to have cuts in dividends. And we, we focus um, strongly on a fundamental assessment of the quality of each company, looking at the business strengths, management quality, uh, the governance assessment of each company, as well as sustainability and ESG characteristics. And we don't invest in those low quality companies as they're the ones that are more likely to have the dividend cuts. And we find the quality is the best predictor over time of whether companies can continue uh, to grow dividends. The, the other aspect is um, in terms of looking at uh, delivering the income is, is really fully valuing franking credits. Uh, for, for a retiree um, with a 0% tax rate, uh, the, the franking credit is obviously you know, a tax refund each year, forms part of the income component. Um, and, and for retirees using this type of strategy, it's, it's a, a, a key element um, of where their income comes from. And so fully valuing that uh, franking credit uh, means that you can gross up the, uh, the dividend yield and you can deliver a very strong return just you know, almost solely from the income component, and you become less concerned about that total return component uh, in your equation compared to, to other strategies. Now looking at the performance of the, of the fund uh, since inception for the equity income strategy, you know, we've delivered a 7.4% yield uh, over that time period with an average uh, dividend of 5.7 and a franking credit of 1.7. So well in excess of the ASX 200's uh, yield and the total return on the strategy um, has been in excess of the ASX 200. We, um, you know, we, given our benchmark unaware approach to portfolio construction and the focus on the stability of income, uh, the, the cycle in terms of performance relative to the index can be quite different but the actual income stream is far more stable. So for example, in 2020, uh, the ASX 200 dividend stream was down 34%. And, and whilst uh, we had a tough year, the, the dividend stream on our portfolio was only down 21. And, and it's now recovered to pre-COVID levels. Um, so that focus on stability of income, lack of concentration and quality uh, is very important to, to producing those more stable uh, dividend profile uh, over time. And finally, just you know, how does that look over time in terms of contribution of return? Uh, for if a retiree invested in our strategy at, at inception in 2011, um, for a, each dollar invested at that time, 
70% of that money has now been returned um, in terms of that consistent uh, annual dividend and, and franking credits. And then there's still been a 48% increase in the capital value over time. So uh, the, the ability to rely on that stable and growing income stream uh, has is, is very beneficial and, and reduces the emphasis on the capital volatility and that mix of returns of uh, you know two thirds of the total return coming from dividends is a very different profile uh, to your typical uh, ASX type product. Thank you and I'll hand back to Chris. Excellent and, and thank you so much Reese, for covering that and, and as I said um, please do send through those questions um, as we will have time for Reese to answer those as we round off this webinar. So just to give an overview of the portfolio and look Reese has very kindly covered a lot of these points for me um, but just to sort of recap on that portfolio strategy again the equity income strategy is looking to provide that after tax income yield above that of the ASX 200 index and again ensuring that that's growing above the rate of inflation and doing that through that actively managed strategy on those high quality income orientated Australian listed companies and shares. The sector limits again as Reese covered before very important when looking at equity income strategies and overcoming some of those limitations that your traditional passive strategies have in terms of Limiting, limiting the concentration risk at a sector level at 22% and obviously that security level at 6% there and diversifying the income stream across those underlying constituents where typically a portfolio within the equity income strategy would look like around 40 different stocks and also looking at the tax effect of how they manage that. So typical turnover around about 25%. So always keeping that conscious in the way that they manage that diversified portfolio of quality companies. And as a, at a snapshot of the equity income strategy, again, that trades under the ASX ticker code of EINC. We can see there that the management fee is at 85 basis points and across those, I guess, as 30 June sector allocations underneath those sector caps, as we noted before, and we can see on the right hand side, the top 10 exposures as of June 30th. In terms of the portfolio characteristics, again, with, with this, we're seeing this being utilised as that core Aussie equity holding for those income focus or income orientated or dependent investors. And why they're using this is really, again, to what Reese highlighted in terms of that long-term performance, but of course also meeting those objectives of getting that average income orientated goal of around 4% yield into their, into their client's account so they can obviously suffice their current standard of living. And again, with that forward looking view and using those high quality tilts within the portfolio, the forecasted yield, as you can see down the bottom there, is currently for the next 12 months to 30 June 2021 at 4.9% when you verse that I guess the general market consensus is around about indicatively 3.6% for the ASX 200 currently. So again on a forward looking view estimating that, that benefit of using this equity income strategy and looking at that fully frank yield of 6.4 as well. And the way that the, the Martin Curry and Reese manage this portfolio has really been rewarded very highly in terms of their credentials, in terms of the independent research that's been given on this as well. As we can see in the bottom right hand corner there, LongSec is highly recommended and with Zenith, Zenith recommended as well. So just a couple of things to consider uh, before we move on to the, the Q&A today is obviously there are investment risks, there's no guarantees, future outcomes are uncertain. Um, today, myself and Reese, in terms of what was presented was only general information only and didn't account to anyone's personal circumstances. Um, I know this is an advisor uh, webinar, but if you do want any uh, further advice, please do seek some a professional and all the research that you need for this particular strategy will be able to be, able to be found either on the Franklin Templeton Lake Mason uh, website or come to the BetaShares page. There's a heap of information on there in terms of all of our funds, especially these active strategies or the active strategy we came today in terms of fact sheets, um, um, the, the research reports that were highlighted before as well. A nice 
very small fonted disclaimer for, um, slide here. I'll uh, let everyone run and grab their glasses and have a quick read of that one. And we'll just go on, because we have got a few questions. So thank you for people for sending those through as we went through the webinar today. Um, look, just to kick off, Reese, do you mind sort of giving us a bit of an update in terms of which sectors or stocks have the strongest prospects for capital returns, dividends per share increasing as the August report season is upon us? Thanks, Chris. Yeah, we we think uh, there's two areas, um, well, probably the three areas. The miners are likely to have uh, very strong dividends given the current high iron ore uh, prices. So we think they've they've got you know almost what we call peak dividend paying capability. So it's just a matter of how much they return. They have next to, to zero debt, but the the issue in those stocks is about sustainability of those dividends. We think the banks have got very strong uh, rebound potential, you know, given the where they were last year, um, providing for recession type scenarios and having excess capital. So we, th we think the banks um, will will surprise in terms of uh, their their off market buybacks. CBA is the only you know, major June reporting bank, but the other ones are more in in November. Um, and then the the consumer stocks. So you know, mo most uh, there's there's low expectations for uh, dividends and capital returns out of consumer stocks because there's concern about you know the, the impacts of, of JobKeeper but you know companies like JB Hi-Fi are just in too strong a position um, with their balance sheet not to not to start uh, increasing returns. Fantastic thank you for that and look we've, we've had a few questions around uh, inflation so it's definitely one that's I guess front of mind in terms of a lot of advisors, um, a lot of advisors sort of scratching their head, especially in the fixed income allocation, but how would the potential rising of inflation impact the EINC strategy and fund? Do you mind just covering that one, please? Sure, the the, the, the good news with inflation for, for uh, equity income is that company revenues uh, are in nominal terms. And so, you know, dividends, profits and dividends tend to be uh, quite nominal. So as inflation rises, company profits rise. And I think you know, simply if you think about it like as a Woolworth supermarket, uh, as inflation comes through, their sales go up, they earn a pretty constant margin on that. So their, their dividend payouts rise. So you know, there's very clear inflation protection uh, in the income stream in, in this type of strategy, which is very different dynamic uh, than, than other uh, yielding type um, asset classes. Excellent, thanks for that. Um, I've got one here, which is, I guess, very relevant for all of us in uh, Sydney, New South Wales, given the current lockdowns. Um, how would the current lockdown in New South Wales impact the fund? Yeah, I mean, cl clearly, it's um, it's it's bad for sentiment. It's bad for people. That's the, that's the worst thing. Um, but we we clearly have a pretty good idea of what the the downside scenario looks like now because you know we we saw it last year and you know even as early as March last year we're working through the scenarios of being you know a pro prolonged lockdown period and so we um, we're looking at what that sort of crisis level of dividend was during 2020 um, but today companies are in a, a much better position uh, the Debt levels for for the typical industrial company are down about 20% on pre-COVID levels. Um, so there was some dilution last year from from those debt reductions and some capital raisings, but companies today are in in a much better position. So um, whilst uh, it will it will be negative at the margin and and probably you know most negative on on physical assets um, such as office buildings and and shopping centres. Um, more broadly, uh, we, we think that the market will be able to look through that. So there'll be some tempering and certainly less confidence in guidance. Um, but, you know, but with the vaccine rollout, we, th we think it will be short lived in a market context. Excellent. Now, the next question, I know you sort of touched on this through the presentation, but the yield from last year in terms of, oh, sorry, this is for our own, so we might, might leave that one, but we've probably got time for another question. And look, there's been a couple of questions just in terms of what you covered around 
I guess some of the risk you, you sort of come into when using more passive income style strategies and just sort of the highlighting that I guess some of those strategies do use backward looking sort of metrics when they're looking at purely just how much a company has historically paid but also looking at I guess some, there's other strategies that do have some rules based in there in terms of you know uh, stock or sector caps within them but at a much higher level why is EINC better positioned even with some of those passive strategies that do say have a 40 percent sector cap or a 10 percent stock cap why would that be more beneficial using this active strategy yeah so we, we, we have much lower concentration limits it's sort of five percent by mm. stock and 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 um, 20 percent by sector and and I think the other the other aspect, um, not just those concentrations, but it's about our focus on sustainable dividends. So even a rules-based strategy is either going to be using past or even consensus uh, dividends, but those consensus earnings and dividends uh, tend to follow a cycle. And so you really need to understand how a, a downside scenario looks on sustainability of dividends, and that and that's really our focus on understanding what's the free cash flow a company can pay in the down part of the cycle. And so it leaves you far less vulnerable um, to shocks. You know, you really, you know, for example, if at, at, at the moment, the miners obviously look fantastic in terms of the level of dividends, but um, you know, and, and no one is really expecting the iron ore price to change a lot. Um, but clearly the iron ore price can go for, through a very large cycle. And it was only a couple of years ago that it was sub $60. Um, and as, as supply conditions change, that can change dramatically. So you, you don't you need you need that more fundamental um, longer term understanding of the cycle um, to avoid uh, those those risks on sustainability of dividend, um, and as well as you know portfolio construction limits that provide you know far more diversification of sources and therefore an emphasis effectively on the more mid cap part of the market to give you a diversified um, stream of dividends rather than the, the largest stocks just with high yield um, that, that can be quite vulnerable. Excellent, no, thank you so much for covering that Reese. And look, I think we're just a little bit over time, but thank you to all that have come on and attended this webinar today. As mentioned earlier, it has been recorded, so you will be able to get, go back over any of the parts that you may have missed or wanna cover again. A uh, special thanks to, to Reese for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate you covering not only the broad market, but also the equity income strategy with us. And thanks, Chris. Everyone, it's been great. No, no worries, mate. And hope hope everyone is keeping safe through this COVID period through New South Wales. And thank you um, for all those out in the other states for attending today. Um, and we look forward to uh, coming on the next webinar very shortly. So. Do jump on the website if you need any any additional information or any other resources, but thank you again.